Good morning. morning. Welcome. Welcome to church this morning. Into God's house we come to be able to proclaim his love, right? To get re-energized. It's always good. That's it. That's it. Please join me in our call to worship this morning. Come rest your spirits in the Lord. There is a place of peace and hope where all may be fed and healed. Come place your trust in God who is always near you. Amen. Please join me in our hymn of adoration, ye servants of God, your master proclaim. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to this place from all sorts of experiences of the week, from struggles, from joys, from heavy burdens, from love that we share one to another. We ask you, O Lord, to please quiet our minds, quiet our hearts. Might we be expectant to hear you and feel you in this place. We open our hearts, Lord, as we pray together the prayer you taught your disciples to pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our psalm for today is taken from Psalm 14. Fools say in their hearts there is no God. They are corrupt, they do abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. They have all gone astray. They are all alike perverse. There is no one who does good. No, not one. (laughs) 
There they shall be in great terror, for God is with the company of the righteous. Oh, that deliverance for Israel would come from Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, Jacob will rejoice, Israel will be glad. We come to a time of uh, greeting one another. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. You have uh, several announcements in your bulletins this morning. There is a, um, a statement here from uh, Board of Ministries making decisions about Ab Quarry property. Um, you can read that at your leisure. At your leisure, it lets you know what's going on with Canonicus. It's also Ab Quarry Summer Gathering on, on the 4th of uh, next Sunday. So if you're able to, um, looks like a lot of fun. There's an insert in there. It's in Exeter, Rhode Island, right? A little bit of a, of, a, of a hike from here, but not too far. Any other announcements? We're still working hard on the craft fair. Any crafters out there that are interested in, in, in a table or any uh, materials that we can help to, to, would be great, would be very well. Uh, and the big sale. And a snack bar. Wow. Can't beat that. And what's the dates again? Oh, the 14th and 21st, maybe? 14th and 21st of October. No, no, this is the 20th. Second and third week in October. So the 13th would be, sorry, 6, 13, 20, and 27 is the four Sundays in October. 13 and 20. Two Sundays. Okay. Any other announcements this morning? Now it comes to the time of giving our gifts, and might we be in the spirit of giving for the Lord? Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings on these gifts. We know that they go to further the kingdom in your world. We know that they're a part of us, but only a small piece of what you give to us, we give back. We raise them in joy, in song, and in praise to your name. And all God's people said, Amen. Please join me in our hymn of worship, He Leadeth Me, O Blessed Thought.
Our scripture reading is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Prayer for the readers. For this season, I bow my knees before the Father, for whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever, amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. What does this text tell us? The church is tasked by God to provide people with the opportunity to be able to commune and and to fellowship with God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. So that's what Paul's talking about here. Paul writes here to show readers that God is apparent to all of us, all people, all nations, all genders, all ethnicities, no one excluded. The language of of family is is on his heart, it's on his mind, and, and, and his soul in his explanation. Paul Paul prays that the believers would be indwelled by the Holy Spirit, which forms the faith in the hearts of everyone. The Holy Spirit is our constant and abiding help in times of struggle, a never-ending source of comfort. Paul prays here that the Ephesians' hearts would be strengthened and open to, to new possibilities. Our souls need prayer, and God seeks to, to communicate with us through prayer. Prayer is key to unlocking the miracles of our lives as well. And in the Gospels, we're shown how prayerful a leader that Jesus was, a perfect model for all of us. The disciples themselves asked Jesus to teach them about prayer. And in this passage, he prays that the disciples of Ephesus would be given the strength to build up each other as well as the kingdom of God. So Paul prays that Jesus will dwell in the hearts of the disciples and that the knowledge of God will be with them in their journey toward their call. The importance of prayer is is always upon all of us, and it's imperative that our lives of faith, we carve out those times in in our lives for prayer, as it's a life-sustaining connection with, with our God. And remember, who needs to do the most talking, right? We need to do more listening than talking when we do pray, right? We're learning. Realizing Christ's love will will lead to spiritual growth, faith formation, and and character in people's lives. Summoning God's spirit and praising God are not optional parts of faith, but they are a must in in every church and in every Christian believer. To praise is is to worship, and without praise, there is no true worship. That's what Paul's telling us in this piece of scripture. So as you... Uh, guided through this meditation, might you think of ways that you can lift up God, that you can connect with God in prayer.
We come to a time of our sharing our joys and concerns before prayer. Any joys or concerns today? The joy of Linda telling the doctor said that she is where she's supposed to be, and even though it's still a long road ahead, uh, he's very happy with everything that's been going on with her healing. Good. And I'd also like to add in a, uh, a blessing for my uh, cousin Trevor and his new wife, Shannon. They were married yesterday. I just want nice. the Lord to bless their future together. They've been Trevor together for seven Shannon. years and very happy. Now has a boot <laughs> and, and doesn't need the crutches all the time. So that's a good thing. He, he, he can bear weight on it now. He's supposed to take it easy, but he can, he can bear weight on it. So that. To keep a little stability. And... Yeah. I think we'll bring him on vacation, the crutches on vacation, just in case. He has it. Does it have it? Does not need it? Does not have it? Oh, yeah. Just, yeah. Especially after long days. Yeah. Safe travels for you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Traveling mercies. Yeah, we fly out tomorrow. Uh, at 5.30 at night, so it's a night flight into Anchorage, and then they stop in Seattle for a little bit, and then on to Anchorage. Yeah, it is a long ride. Yeah. 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 Well, it's one stop in Seattle, but it's, it, it's just, just, just a quick stop. I've been before. I've done just a cruise. But this, he's never been, so this time it's, it's, it's Denali and, and the wilderness for three days and then the cruise after that. So, so it'll be fun. It'll be a nice trip. Um, we're looking forward to it. It's always tough to leave the dogs, but they're in good hands. Brittany, Brittany takes really good care of them still. They'll, they'll, get, they'll get spoiled. Yeah, those are the babies. Yeah. Um, any other concerns, joys, celebrations? When I come back, we'll only be one week shy of a year here already. Can you imagine how fast that went by? Didn't that go by quick? Time flies when you're having fun, right? Yeah. Yeah, went by fast. But uh, stay tuned. Priscilla will be preaching next week on the 4th and Mike on the 11th. So you're in for some real excitement. So that's always good. That's, that's always good, yeah. No, you got to keep out the big words. The big words are tough, right? I always look ahead to make sure I don't have any big words either. Any other? Everybody's good. Okay, very good. You enjoyed your vacation with your great nephews? Yeah. yeah. It's nice to have company, and then it's nice to get things back to normal too. It's uh, sometime you need a vacation from the vacation. Yeah, they were very cute. They, they, they uh, definitely gave us some entertainment last week, so that was good. That was good, yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yes. I think... I think we should keep in mind the athletes and the people in France and hope or pray that, you know, God supports that, the, the event so that people are peaceful, and celebrate in the appropriate way, rather than bombings. So the athletes, people in France, the Olympics in Paris. You know, Paris is is a, is a bit of a of, of a um, a zoo when there's nothing going on there. Can you imagine when the Olympics are there? It's really quite the place. Um, nothing like you see on TV. Trust me, it's it's a it's it's a beautiful place, but nothing like you see on TV. But. Uh, Good, yeah, so prayers for the, for the athletes and, and, and the people watching and, and safety and good, good. All right, let's come to Almighty God in prayer. Heavenly Father, you, you hear our request. We, we, we pray for Linder and we pray for Doug and their continued healing. We pray for athletes from around the world who are now in Paris for the Olympics and spectators and all the families and, and physicians and everyone that goes with them, and we just ask for, for a, a peaceful Olympics, that things might go smoothly. We ask for continued prayers for this congregation as they continue to walk their journey with you. 
We look to you, Lord, and we ask the continued strength for all of those gathered here, those who are at home, those who are listening, those who church is, is, is upon their heart always. We look to you, Lord, and we raise our concerns. We raise our concerns for, for comfort, for peace, for solace in a world that is often without comfort, peace, and solace. We ask for help, Lord, for those things that we don't understand that happen in these days, and we look to you for knowledge, for wisdom, and for understanding. We ask for traveling mercies for all those traveling, Lord, that they might arrive safely and return back home safely again. All these things we raise to you, knowing full well that you are there with us each and every step of the way. And all God's people said, Amen. Our hymn of petition is, Here I am, Lord, as you prepare yourselves for the message.
first time I heard that song, I had gone to a, an Emmaus, a Catholic retreat, and I was, I, was in, uh, I was in college at BCC at the time in Fall River, and um, I was the only Baptist in the crowd. Everybody else was Catholic. And it was funny because the, the, the priest said in the beginning, you know, when I looked at the registrations and I saw one Baptist in the crowd, I knew somebody would be able to sing. So it was, it was always a good thing. But yeah, very special song. Our scripture today is taken from the book of John, chapter 6, verses 1 through 21. Jesus walks on the water. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near, and when he looked up and he saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he knew himself what he was going to do. And Philip answered him, 200 denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get even a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in this place, so they sat down about 5,000 in all. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. And Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea and they got into a boat and they started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing and when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now, there were times when Jesus had a real hankering to be away from the crowds, when he, he just needed some time to kind of regroup no one can be comfortable with being spot on all the time, and you can understand the tremendous responsibility and the fatigue that it might have brought on. He was under continuous strain, and he needed some downtime. He had so much to teach the disciples by helping them to develop a, a deeper understanding of him and his mission, and that was something that necessitated time away from the mobs and the crowds. He also needed uninterrupted time for prayer. There was a whole lot happening all at once and inevitably a, a great deal more on the horizon as well. There was a need to, to go away to kind of cool off the hot trail of pursuit by the authorities. They were ready to take him by force. You, you heard that in the, in the scripture. He wasn't ready for that. There was still more work to be done before the conflict reached its climax. And as we talked about last week, from Capernaum to the opposite side of the Sea of Galilee was about four miles in length, as the crow flies, and Jesus set sail. Now you can imagine the amazement of the people who were observing the things that Jesus had done. This is someone that you, you don't want to lose sight of. Really easy to see exactly where the boat was heading and the people taking off on foot was a, a very real event to, to keep up and continue to follow his journey. Now, the River Jordan flows into the north end of the Sea of Galilee. Geography is not my strong suit. You know those pictures that say, you are here, and you've got to figure out where to go? Never good at that. It's not a good thing. But from what I've researched, if it helps you, the River Jordan flows into the north end of the Sea of Galilee. Two miles up the river are the more shallow parts of the Jordan. Near those shallow areas was a village called Bethsaida in Galilee. 
There was a very grassy plain there, which is the stage for what's happening in our story today. At first, Jesus went up into the hill behind the plain and was sitting there with the disciples when the crowd showed up in these great numbers. They had, as we talked about last week, made that nine to 10 mile trek around the top of the river with a vengeance. They went very quickly. And because Passover was very close on the calendar, the crowds that were nearby were even larger than normal along the way. Could have been that they were on their way to Jerusalem and were taking the same route, and others may have been Galilean pilgrims traveling north. Now, the shallowness was a way to wade safely to where the, they, they needed to go, perhaps, so, so those inlets in the Jordan where they were able to walk across. The route they took was a bit longer, but avoided going through much hated Samaritan territory. They may have picked up some folks along the way that were headed to the Passover feast, so this crowd is just growing and growing and growing. And we know that Jesus, when he saw the crowd, he felt badly for them. We talked about that last week. After all, they were hungry, they were exhausted, and they needed to be fed. Now, this was Philip's home turf, so it was natural to look to him for answers because being from Bethsaida, he would have local insight. And so Jesus asked him where they might find some food. And Philip's answer was, was a very practical one, but a bit hopeless. We don't have enough money to buy all this food. It would take weeks and months of wages to be able to feed even a little morsel to each person. He brought up economics in securing this type of a spread. And he calculated that it would take at least six months wages. And even that wouldn't give people very much. Then Andrew shows up with this young boy who had these five loaves of barley bread and these two very small fish about the size of a sardine. You know how big sardines are, not all that big, right? The child probably had packed his own picnic lunch that day and while out he had attached himself to to the crowd and this was Andrew's usual work, bringing people to Jesus. And now looking at what the boy had, one would definitely surmise that there, there wasn't a whole lot there. Now, we who are good cooks can add a little water to the soup. You know, a company shows up unexpected, but this is a lot of company. A little bit of water is not going to do the trick. The quality of what was there, barley bread, was considered a poor man's staple, made of barley flour. The fish were no bigger than sardines, and these fish were usually pickled, and, and, and they were well known. You see, fresh fish, like we can get here, was unheard of there. In those days, there was no way to transport it and to keep it fresh. These small fish were caught caught and they were pickled into a kind of spicy mixture to kind of get down that dry and and non-tasteful bread. And Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down. Some sources say that it was in groups of 50 that the people sat down. He then took the bread and the fish and he blessed them like the head of the family would do before a meal. And the people ate and were filled to satisfaction. When everyone had their fill, Jesus ordered all the leftovers to be picked up. Now, it was regular Jewish practice to leave something for those who had served them. Now, who would think that there'd be anything left over, right? But Jesus blessed it, thanked God for it, and fed over 5,000 people. You wouldn't think there'd be anything left over, but hold on to your hats. There were 12 baskets of food left over. Each disciple had his own basket. It was a bottle-shaped kind of basket. No Jew ever left home without it. They carried these in order to keep the Jewish food laws of of clean and unclean food, and because they were characteristically collectors. And the hungry crowd was therefore fed and fed well. Now, we may never know exactly what took place on the plane that day, and several options are open to us. It may have been regarded simply as a miracle where Jesus multiplied what was available. If we're still questioning, and it's perfectly normal to question and to wonder, it's been suggested that this really was a meal much like communion. It's thought that because the language Jesus used was exactly the same language that he used at the Last Supper when he talks about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. It it may have physically appeared as just a morsel like our bread and our grape juice. But with the blessing of Jesus and his presence, it turned into so much more. Clearly nourished their hearts and souls like like happens at our communion table each month. To the average person, 
at our communion table, it's just a piece of bread and a little bit of juice, but to we who know the Lord, it's so much more. There's another thought that other people also may have contributed to the meal with supplies and provisions that they might have had, other people who were, were, were out for the day, or the stores that, that the disciples may have had kept for themselves. Either way, Jesus thanked God for what he had, and he shared it among the thousands that were gathered there that day. Perhaps moved by his example, everyone who had done the same, and in the end there was enough, and more than enough for everybody. Whatever happened, there were key figures present there who without this miracle may never have been possible. Andrew, who brought this young boy to Jesus, that made the miracle possible. Now put yourselves for a moment in the life and the mind of that little boy who had what anyone and even him could, could think was maybe just a mere pittance. Upon looking at that gathered crowd, my lunch for all these people, right? How often in life do we ourselves think that what we have to offer is not enough. I'm sure that little boy thought that what he had was not enough. I'm sure Andrew thought what the little boy had wasn't enough. But the reality is that no one ever knows what will result out of what we bring to Jesus. No one has a clue what will happen when we bring others to Christ as well. We're so brainwashed in this life that, that what we have does not measure up. How often do you hear that? You'll never amount to anything. What we have doesn't measure up. It's not good enough. Well, while it may not measure up to the naysayers of this world, bless their hearts, the people, when you really stop to think about it, don't count for a hill of beans, those naysayers. It does count with Jesus. In Jesus' eyes, we measure up. You measure up. In Jesus' eyes, what you offer is more than enough, and that's all that matters. I found a good illustration of this on e-sermons. It's a tale of an old German schoolmaster who, when he entered his class of boys in the morning, he used to remove his cap and kind of bow ceremoniously to them. And one asked him why he did this, and his answer was, you never know what one of these boys may someday become. And he was right, because one of them was Martin Luther. Can you imagine? Andrew really had no clue what was going, what was going on when he brought this young boy to Jesus. But when you really think about it, he was providing the staples for a miracle. Just imagine for a moment the possibilities that we put out there when we help to lead someone else to Christ. The young boy, not a whole lot to offer, but he was willing to give it up. What if he hadn't been willing to share his lunch that day? What happens when we hold back, when we, when we hang on to the material things of this life for all they're worth? And in the end, are they in and of themselves really worth all that much? You can't take it with you, right? They're not worth all that much, not if we hold on to them, but when we're willing to give them to Christ, the story turns out a whole lot different, doesn't it? Jesus is in need of what we can bring to him. We are in need of giving to him all that we can. It may not be as much, but he needs it. We need it. It may not be that the world is denied miracle after, it may well be that the world is denied miracle after miracle and triumph after triumph because we will not bring to Jesus what we have and what is needed. If we give of ourselves to his service, there is no limit to what can be done. We sang it, here I am, Lord. Use me, Lord, right? Even though we don't feel like we have much, it's important to remember that little is always much in the hands of Christ. So here we have the reaction of the crowd. They're ready to take him by force. You remember that part of the scripture? And they were gathered, and the Jews are waiting, and they're still waiting for that prophet whom they believe the Messiah had promised them. And the Lord your God will raise for you a prophet like me from among you, from the brethren, it says in Deuteronomy. Him you shall heed. And in that moment at Bethsaida, they were willing to accept Jesus as that prophet and take him by force to be their mighty warrior and to carry him to power on a wave of popular acclaim. But it wasn't time. And that wasn't his, his course of action. That wasn't his mission. It was not long after that the crowd had changed their tune and instead were now yelling, crucify him, crucify him, right? Not long after. 
Why at this moment were they in his court? Why eager to support him? Because at this moment, Jesus had given them what they wanted. He had healed them. He had made them well. He had fed them. He had taken away their hunger. Why not make him their leader? The way the crowd looked at this leaves kind of a, a bad taste in our mouths, and we need to ask ourselves, how are we any different than the crowd? When we need to be consoled, when we're sorrowful, when we need strength in times of difficulty, when we, when we crave peace in a world that has much too much upheaval, when we need solace in times of depression, there is no one as wonderful as Jesus. In the eye of the storms of our lives, to quote the, the, the famous song, he remains in control when we engage and build a relationship with him. When we open our hearts and our minds, he is there. But how many of us, when faced with the idea of giving something up, putting forth some effort, carrying some kind of, of cross, hightail it for the nearest diversion? There's a great number of people who love Jesus for what they can get out of him. Are any of you fans of Young Sheldon? You ever watch Young Sheldon? Okay, so Young Sheldon, there's a this little girl in the story called Missy, the daughter. And she, um, she's uh, playing baseball, a girl to play baseball. And she has, gets a cross from her mother because she's having kind of a slump in her, in her pitching and her, and her hitting. And so she has this cross and she, that the mother gives her. And she thinks this is kind of like this little bit piece of magic. And she, she rubs it on her mitt and she rubs it on her ball. And she takes a, a dollar from the from little kid next door to, to let him rub his mitt and his ball with it. And, and, and the mother tells us, that's not what Jesus is for, you know? It's not for what we can get out of him, but for a deep, intimate relationship with him. People in the crowd wanted to, to use him for their own needs and their own dreams and to mold him the way that, that they wanted to have him be. They looked for a Messiah who would be king and conqueror, and they knew he had the power and he could do marvelous things. Why not harness that power? for their own selfish wants and desires. After all, they wanted it when they wanted it, and they wanted it now. Right? Again, we need to always be examining our, our own motivation. Do we accept what it is that Jesus wants for our lives, or do we just try to use him for what we need? And then back on the shelf he goes. Till the next time. Is our prayer, Lord, give me strength to do what you want me to do, or is it in reality, Lord, give me strength to do what I want to do? The attitude of the crowd that day is not very different than we find today. And they would have followed Jesus at that moment because he was giving them what they wanted and they wanted what they wanted him for. The attitude kind of still lingers in this world. They wanted the gifts, but they were not willing to expend any effort or any self-sacrifice. They wanted all the glory, but no cross using him instead of allowing him to use them. The story is found in all four Gospels, the feeding of the 5,000, but John kind of takes it a step further than the others, and it was an extraordinary miracle, but a simple incident in which John's eyes were, were open to an understanding that he would never lose sight of as to what Jesus was really like. When Jesus had finished feeding the 5,000 and the crowd had attempted to make him their leader, Jesus was able to slip away to the hills alone. This is at the same time that he had just received word of the horrible death of John the Baptist, his cousin. And Jesus needed time to spend in solace to be able to process that. And the day went by very quickly, and it was the time that is referred to as what Barclay, my most favorite com commentator, refers to as the second evening. It's a time between twilight and darkness. Jesus had still not reunited with the disciples, and now the disciples had gone off on their own because it's what Jesus had asked them to do. Leaving Jesus sent on, uh, on them ahead of him while he managed to talk the crowd into going home. He probably had in mind to walk around the head of the lake and rejoin them again in Capernaum, which was where they were headed by boat. The disciples disembarked, and it got very windy, and, and the water was like foam, and the full moon was upon them. And on the hillside, Jesus had communed with God. Because the moon, Jesus could see the boat and the rowers having some, some real difficulty. So he came down the hill, and by this time, the boat was very close to shore. They saw Jesus walking on the water, 
Did he really walk on the water? That's not an important point here. The point is that when they needed him the most, Jesus was there. The point is that when we need Jesus the most, Jesus is there. But the disciples were fearful when they looked up and Jesus reassured them to not be afraid. And Jesus, Jesus reassures us of that same thing. Jesus knew they were afraid. Jesus knows when we're afraid. Jesus spoke similar words about fear and what is thought to be. 365 times in the Bible, Jesus talks about fear. It had to be important. He had to know that fear is very real for all of us. Otherwise, why would he have devoted his limited amount of time to that subject matter? A great fisherman story that John would never forget, and John saw the wonders that are still there for us to see. He saw that Jesus is always on the lookout, watching, never too busy to think of them or think of us. Whatever we are up against, Jesus is watching. There are those here today that need to hear that all-important message. There are those that, that really need to take that message to heart. Jesus is watching and is proud of you. He's proud of all of you. He's proud of all of us. We measure up. We are good enough. And what we have to offer matters. It matters to him. It matters to us. And that's all that matters. Life is living with the loving eye of Jesus upon us. He watches. He comes. He helps. It's the wonder of the Christian life that there is nothing no situation in this life when we are ever alone. Amen. You join me in our hymn of benediction, I have decided to follow Jesus. When you pray, you always forget somebody. So Shannon and Trevor, prayers for their new life together. Uh, prayers for Brittany and Graham, who are about to do the same thing in about three weeks. So we'll keep them in our prayers as well. And so go now, knowing full well that Jesus is with you every step of the way, that you matter, that you measure up, that you're worth something in his eyes. Amen? Amen. Amen.